Hello, everyone. My name is Miranda Wagner, and I am the agricultural conservationist with the Sherburn Soil and Water Conservation District. And tonight, we're going to talk about um, wetland and shoreland um, policy, um, opportunities for restorations, all of the good stuff uh, surrounding water in Sherburn County. And I would like to remind everyone that this is being recorded. Um, we will send it out um, once we have it loaded onto our YouTube page as well. And because it is going to be uh, loaded onto our YouTube page, we do want to make sure that if you have specific questions for your property or a neighbor's property, that we keep those questions for uh, a phone call to one of us during normal business hours. But if you have uh, general questions, we're going to take um, them at the end after uh, all three of us present tonight. And then we can we can go through those, any general questions that you might have. Um, and with that, I'm going to let uh, Zach Katormson from Sherburn County Planning and Zoning uh, start us off. Well, thank you, Miranda. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Zach Katormson. I'm the Assistant Zoning Administrator at Sherburn County. I've been at the, the county for seven years now, I'm enjoying every minute of it. I uh, love the people of Sherburne County and all the natural resources we have here. Um, tonight, I'm going to be giving a, a short presentation on just a basic wetland and shoreland overview, uh, some of the regulations and requirements. And uh, of course, if you have any questions at the end, uh, ask away. So first off, I wanna talk a little bit about wetlands and um, start going through the slideshow here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so first off, I'm going to discuss what a wetland is and what benefits they provide. So wetland is defined as areas inundated or saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency and duration sufficient to support hydrophytic vegetation. And hydrophytic vegetation is are plants that survive in anaerobic conditions. So what we can extract from that definition is three different um, requirements. And the first is we need hydrology, so you need water. And that doesn't mean standing water. That actually means uh, water during the growing season within 12 inches of grade. So there could be you know, saturated soil, not actually standing water, and it meets that requirement. Because of the saturation, anaerobic conditions are created and hydric soils form. And so the hydric soils are, are soils that, do, that lack free oxygen. And there's a type of plants, hydrophytic vegetation, that has evolved to uh, thrive in in hydric soils. So if you have the hydrology, the soils, and vegetation, you meet the criteria of a wetland. And so the, some of the benefits, and this is just a, a list of a few I missed, I, I know I missed and didn't include a lot here, are, you know, some of the benefits that wetlands provide are wildlife habitat, water retention and detention, water quality protection, and groundwater recharge, low flow augmentation, and, and of course, recreational op opportunities. Some of the things I didn't include there is pollinator habitat, and then as well as commercial uh, benefits such as wild rice production or cranberry. A uh, little sad note in the bottom there, um, there was once 18.6 million acres of wetland in, in the state of Minnesota, and today only about 50% remains. So that's over 9 million acres of wetlands that were drained, excavated, or filled. So, in 1991, the Wetland Conservation Act was enacted by the state of Minnesota. And the idea behind the Wetland Conservation Act was no net loss of wetlands. And so how they decided to do that was that wetlands must not be impacted unless replaced by restoring or creating wetlands, wetland areas of at least equal public value. So in our area in Sherburn County is what that comes down to is if wetland impacts are proposed, wetlands are need to be replaced at a two to, two to one replacement ratio. So I, I'm gonna use easy numbers. We don't see impacts this large, uh, but if someone were to propose one acre of wetland impacts with a project, let's say a large corporation is building a, a, a new building in a large parking lot, they would need to replace for those impacts at two to one. So they would need to purchase or create two acres of wetlands. Uh, currently, I've been notified that those wetland credits, which are sold by the square foot, are over $3 a credit. So if you impact an acre, that's 43,560 square feet. 
times two because of the two to one replacement ratio. So 80,000 square feet times $3 a square foot. So it becomes very expensive. So what is an impact? An impact is draining, filling, or excavation of a type three, four, five wetland. Now the wetland regulations do differ a little bit depending on the type of wetland. So I'm gonna quickly kind of run through the different types of wetlands that we see and have here in Minnesota. And this is a classification system known as the Circular 39. And it goes one through eight. So we will start at number one. So type one wetlands are seasonally flooded basins or, or flood plains. And a lot of times um, these areas don't hold water for very long during the growing season. And a lot of times these areas are farmed or either hayed. Type two wetlands have a little bit more water and then generally they receive their hydrology from groundwater rather than a type one wetland, which gets its, its hydrology from surface water flow. Um, so uh, again, these uh, type two wetlands do not have standing water most of the growing season. A lot of these type two wetlands are hayed or, or again, they will, um, agricultural producers will try to farm through them. Uh, depending on the year, they may or may not um, produce a crop. Type three wetlands are shallow marshes or, or, and they usually have water or waterlogged soils through a, a large duration of the growing season, usually six inches or more of water. Uh, this is where we start to see more of our sedges and cattails and arrowhead. Now type three, four and five wetlands, which I'll get to four and five here in a minute, have a little bit more uh, restrictions on them as far as wetland regulations go. Uh, type four wetlands are deep marshes. They usually have water through throughout the growing season. Now last year, a lot of our type four wetlands, um, definitely our type three wetlands and even some of our type four wetlands dried up or was very shallow water in a lot of the type four wetlands. Uh, this is where you start to see more cattails and reeds and bulrushes. Type five wetlands are open water wetlands. And here's some funny for you. We got get, get a lot of cattails in the uh, open open water wetlands, type five wetlands. Uh, though, of course, uh, three to six feet deep in water and, and fringed with a border of a veg emergent vegetation. A lot of these type five wetlands in Sherburne County are classified and, and designated by the Minnesota DNR as public water and uh, classified as natural environment lakes. Don't eat cattails with mustard on them. I don't think it'd be, taste very good. Uh, type six wetland is a shrub swamp. Uh, you'll see a lot of red osier dogwood, willows, pig alders, and, and things of the such. Uh, these provide great uh, wildlife habitat. Um, they usually have uh, water most of the year, but you'll have hummocky uh, ups and downs within these areas that do provide animals with, with places to, to hide. Type seven wetlands are, are forested or wooded wetlands. Um, these soils are, are waterlogged within a few inches of the, the surface during the growing season. Uh, we see a lot of, of trees here, of course, it's a, a wooded wetland, so tamarack, white cedar, black spruce, balsam, red maple, and black ash. And then finally, we have a type eight wetlands, which we do have in Sherburne County, but, but not very common, and type eight wetlands are bogs. Uh, of course, there's a lot of peat there involved, spongy mosses, sedges, leather leaf, and cranberries and cat, cotton grass. So my role at Sherburne County as the local governing unit for the Wetland Conservation Act is to work with applicants to provide them a, a channel to um, submit their application for review. Now, every application uh, within the Wetland Conservation Act that comes in is reviewed by the Technical Evaluation Panel. And, and that's known as the TEP. There's a lot of acronyms in, in the wetland world. And the TEP is made up of the Minnesota DNR area hydrologist, the Army Corps of Engineers. They're on the federal level. They, they enforce section 404 and 401 of the Clean Water Act. Uh, the Board, Board of Water and Soil Resources, which is a state agency, when they kind of administer and oversee the Wetland Conservation Act and the Soil and Water Conservation District. The technical evaluation panel gets together once a month to review all of the applications in Sherburne County that proposed to impact wetlands. 
Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about shoreline regulations in Sherburne County. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to go through uh, the jurisdiction of the shoreland overlay district, uh, some of the big regulations, kind of the big four is what I call them, and then I'll uh, finish off with the shoreland alteration permit. So where do shoreland rules come into play? And on the far right there, we can see uh, there's a nice diagram that shows uh, where the shoreline overlay district exists. And that's within a thousand feet of a lake that's a public water body and 300 feet within a river, which is classified by the DNR as a public water course. Now, going a little bit deeper with that, the DNR has jurisdiction below the ordinary high water level. So in the top there, there's a small little, little um, diagram that shows the ordinary high water level is the dashed line. Below that line and the ordinary high water level is an elevation that's set by the DNR based off of um, indications left on a landscape, uh, which generally is vegetation on, on basins, on, on lakes. Above that ordinary high water level is within the shoreline overlay district, which is, is the county's jurisdiction. So what's regulated within the shoreline over, overlay district? And these are the big four that I, that I kind of spoke about earlier. And that would be vegetation alterations, grading, excavation, and filling, so moving of dirt, uh, structure setbacks, elevations, and height restrictions, and then finally, impervious surface. So vegetation alterations and the general regulations and the most restrictive veg vegetation removal standards are within the shore impact zone. And the shore impact zone is defined of, as half the distance of the setback for each lake. Now there's three different classifications of lakes that we have in Sherburne County. There's natural environment lakes, which have a 150 foot setback, recreational development, which have a 100 foot setback, and general development lakes, which have a 75 foot setback. And intensive vegetation removal is not allowed within the shore impact zone. And in an abbreviated definition of intensive vegetation removal is removal of vegetation in strips and blocks. So essentially clear cutting is not allowed within that area. Additionally, the uh, intensive vegetation removal standards apply within a bluff impact zone. So that's within a bluff and within 30 feet of the top and the toe of the bluff. And then what isn't regulated? So vegetation removal necessary for the construction of driveways, septic structures, um, trimming and limbing of trees, and then the removal of dead, diseased, and hazardous trees. Now, when it comes to removing uh, dead, diseased, hazardous trees, and I forgot to include in this slide invasive species, also included in that list, is we like to work with our residents and have them email pictures of the dead tree to be removed. Preferably during the summertime, photos you know, taken during the summertime to show that the tree is, is dead. Uh, we then reply to that email with something, with an email, letting the, the property owner, they can remove the tree without needing to obtain a shoreline alteration permit. That way, when the neighbors call, when somebody out on the lake, a concerned resident calls, uh, we can inform them that, nope, we're, they're good to go. We've, we've done our due diligence. Uh, they're just removing a dead tree. And that way the, the property owner also has something in writing. A couple of quick photos here in the slide up in the top left is, is good vegetation. Uh, this is a buffer that was installed on one of our Sherburne County lakes. And then on the bottom left is a unfortunate situation where a, a property owner did remove and clear cut, a, uh, clear -cut vegetation on a bluff. Um, that ended up, uh, a restoration was required. And they actually had to uh, hire a local restoration company to come in and, and revegetate that that area. So grading, excavating, and filling is another um, regulated item within the shore impact zone. One of the big things uh, that, that comes up is erosion versus sediment control. And erosion control is practices that hold soil in place. And sediment control prevents soil that has eroded from leaving the site. So some examples of erosion control would be straw thrown out on the ground on disturbed soil, uh, straw blanket, erosion control mat, uh, things like that. Sediment control would be silt fence, uh, which is in the top right of that uh, image on the, on the left side of the screen. Uh, filter logs or bio logs is another common sediment control measure. Um, 
these activities or best management practices are required on, on projects on riparian lots where soil is disturbed. I also want to talk a little bit about structure setbacks, elevations, and height. So as I mentioned before, structure setbacks differentiate depending on the classification of the water body. There are some um, caveats to that. There are administrative exemptions that, that can be applied uh, depending on the uh, surrounding properties, um, known as the setback averaging or lineup rule. Um, while using those administrative exemptions, structures still cannot uh, build within the short impact zone, which is again, the half the distance of the required setback. Structures built within the shoreline overlay district are also required to meet elevations. And the elevation requirements are three feet above the ordinary high water level or highest known, whichever is greater. Or if there is a floodplain elevation that has been set on that water body by uh, FEMA, that is the low floor elevation requirement. And then finally, structure height. So uh, structures cannot exceed 25 feet in height within the shoreland overlay district. Um, there's a handy little diagram on the, on the top there that, that states height of building. Um, 25 feet is an easy way to say it, uh, but it is really what it comes down to is uh, the highest adjoining ground level or 10 feet above the lowest adjoining ground level, whichever is lower. And that's measured to the halfway point between the peak and the eave. So 25 feet is allowed. Um, that helps uh, preserve our views of our lakes around um, Sherburne County. And then finally, let's talk about impervious surface. So impervious surface is any constructed surface that prevents or slows the infiltration, infiltration of water into the soil. And as, as we know here in Sherburne County, impervious surface um, is one of the most observable and apparent um, things we can do to help protect and, and promote um, water quality on our public water bodies and, and wetlands. Uh, in these quick diagrams I have here, you can see that natural ground cover promotes 40% evaporation and transpiration from plants, while only 10% runs off, 50% soaking into the ground. Uh, when we get a property with 75% or more impervious, which is a lot, we don't see that in Sherburne County, um, we, we knock down to 30% evaporation and transpiration, 15% soaks into the ground, and 55% of the water runs off the site. Um, impervious surfaces include rooftops, decks, even though there's gaps between the, the deck boards, decks do count as impervious surface. Sidewalks, patios, swimming pools, driveways, whether they're gravel, bituminous, or concrete, or other sim similar surfaces. And again, there's a 25% impervious surface uh, coverage limit within Sherburne County. Um, and that calculation is, is based off of the lot size that is above the ordinary high water level. So some lots may be an acre in size, uh, but maybe a quarter acre of that lot is below the ordinary high water level. We would use three fourths of an acre, 0.75 acres for, for calculating the impervious surface. And for all these items, generally a shoreline alteration permit is required. Uh, vegetation removal, grading, excavating, filling, constructing structures, all requires a shoreline alteration permit. Uh, this is just a quick image of the, the application. Um, you can find this application on the Sherburne County website in the planning and zoning department section. Uh, we require you know, vegetation to be removed. Or with each proposed project, we wanna know what, what's being removed for vegetation, what revegetation plans are, what are the erosion control best management practices being installed, uh, and of course, a, a detailed site plan um, with impervious surface uh, also included within that. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and here's some contact information for you all. Um, it's my understanding that this will be on the Soil and Water Conservation District's YouTube channel, but if you have any questions, you can give me a call. That's my direct number, and there's my email address here listed as well. I also included the Board of Water and Soil Resources Wetland Specialist contact information. Uh, he's a great resource for any Wetland Conservation Act questions. I also included the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources area hydrologist James Fidel's contact information. And so he's a, a wonderful re resource on anything that uh, may be uh, conducted below the ordinary high water of a lake. Um, and he is a great resource uh, to help uh, uh, with our, our existing shoreline ordinance that we have.
And that's all I got. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Zach. Um, if you have any questions that you're worried that you're going to forget now, um, you can go ahead and throw them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll take questions at the end. And um, remember, any questions, make sure that if they're site specific, that you contact us during business hours. But if you have general questions about wetlands or shoreland, um, you can go ahead and hold those till the end. So I'm going to briefly touch back on wetlands before I pass over to Franny. So uh, my name is again, Miranda Wagner and I'm with the Sherburn Soil and Water Conservation District. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, wetland restorations. So as Zach uh, briefly covered, uh, just a reminder that there are eight different types of wetlands that we recognize. Um, a lot of the times we're really thinking about type three, type four wetlands. Those are wetlands that have open water and a lot of the vegetation that we really recognize as being a wetland. So things like cattails and, and reeds and um, you, might, you might notice a duck floating here and there. Um, but there are many types of wetlands, including type one wetlands, which a lot of the time we see those in floodplains and they might not usually have standing water in them um, besides a, a few days during the growing season. So here's a quiz and I know all the answers are there, but they, these are questions or comments that I know I receive on the phone and I'm sure Zach has as well. So. When we're talking about wetlands, it's important to know that does a wetland have to have cattails, open water, ducks, rotten egg smell, or muskrats to be a wetland? No. Wetlands can look like the picture on the, on the right where there's open water, lily pads, um, but they can also look like uh, this. Oh, go back, thanks. Um, this is just a reed canary, reed canary um, wet meadow that has saturated soils, um, hydric vegetation, but it doesn't necessarily have the standing water that we think of when we are envisioning wetlands in our head. So to go over quickly the three parameters of a wetland one more time, um, we need to have hydric vegetation, we need to have hydric soils, and we must have hydrology. So um, we have our our um, iris on the on the left, we have our hydric soils, and you can tell that it's hydric soils. In Sherburn County, we generally have pretty brown soils, but in here you can see a dark layer on top, and then you can kind of see some brighter oranges and reds in there. And then last, we have uh, hydrology, which in this case is standing water, but there are also some other indicators in this um, picture, including um, shallow roots on the trees, we see moss and we also see water lines on those trees. And I borrowed this picture from um, the Board of Water and Soil Resources. So when we're looking at wetland restorations, what we need to do is to restore those three parameters. So there are different ways that we affect wetlands. Um, first of which is hydrology. And we do that in the way of tile, ditches or fill. And uh, the picture on the bottom left is a ditch in the agricultural field. And that not only pulls water from directly where the ditch is, but there's also something called lateral effect. So that's pulling uh, water from, um, depending on the soil, you know, 10, 20 plus feet um, on either side of the ditch. Um, and then tile, of course. And a lot of the time we think about agricultural fields having tile which some of them do, but we also have used tile extensively in Sherburn County in our cities and on private property. Um, it's part of our county ditch system. And those are other ways that we have pulled water away from wetlands and, um, and impacted them. Um, another way that we impact them, and this is really just by removing hydrology is the soils. So when we're restoring wetlands, we don't necessarily need to do anything to the soils except for make sure that they return to their previous state with hydrology. We don't physically need to remove or change the soil or add soil back to it, but what we do when we remove hydrology is we, we take away a lot of the, the chemical processes that happen in hydric soils. Um, and when we add oxygen back into these soils that may usually be saturated or fully inundated, um, we've taken 
or we've put, we've allowed a lot of uh, biological processes back into um, wetlands that maybe weren't necessarily happening. And then lastly, we need to make sure that we are working with our vegetation again. So the bottom right picture, I actually took that from um, Rice County Soil and Water Conservation District. So this is an agricultural field where there's a small wetland um, that maybe isn't there every year, but I guarantee that when it's dry, they are absolutely farming that corner. So we, we do several things of vegetation. We, we remove it, we allow invasive species to come in. Um, and then again, with the lack of hydrology in, in these wetlands, we allow species to move in that wouldn't normally be able to survive in, that an in those anaerobic conditions. So there are several funding opportunities um, statewide and then some locally that I'm going to just briefly touch on. A lot of the funding goes to uh, the Prairie Pothole region, which is the map on the right. Um, Sherburne County is usually just right outside of the Prairie Pothole region, um, but there, are, there can be some funding opportunities depending on what you wanna do and the quality of the wetland and and really how much funding resources would need to go back into it. So there's the Natural Resources Conservation Service. They have a um, easement program for wetlands. Um, the Board of Water and Soil Resources has a program um, for, for wetland banking. Soil and Waters, uh, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, uh, use state and local funds. They can leverage those funds to work with other agencies, but also help with the Reinvest in Minnesota program. And then I'm just going to briefly say that the DNR, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, nonprofits like Minnesota Land Trust and Ducks Unlimited all have an interest in wetlands. And depending on the location and the amount of resources that need to go into it, would be able to assist with a, um, a wetland restoration. And then lastly, I did want to point out there are a few companies that serve in Sherburne County um, that can do wetland restoration work. There are more in Minnesota, but these are three um, more local companies. Um, the first is Natural Resources Restoration Inc. out of Cambridge. The top right picture is actually from their website. Um, the Prairie Restoration Inc., um, which is in Princeton or PRI, um, that's the bottom left. And it looks like they're putting in some um, revegetating a wet area. And then in the bottom right, um, this is from the Minnesota Native Landscape or formerly Minnesota Native Landscape, but now MNL out of Otsego doing a erosion control and um, live plant restoration there. So these are all companies that can come out, um, do consultations and do both the, the engineering and the vegetative sides of wetland restorations. Because if you have, um, ditches or you have tile, a lot of that hydrology needs to be restored for a wetland to function properly. So now I'm going to hand it over to Franny, who's going to talk about uh, shoreland restorations. Thanks, Miranda. Uh, my name is Franny Jurdy. I'm the urban conservationist with the Sherburne Soil and Water Conservation District, um, and I work a lot with landowners on um, doing different shoreline restoration um, techniques. So I'm just going to kind of go over the most common uh, methods that we typically use on, on smaller um, projects. And so that kind of had a very similar slide, but this is kind of the same thing with a little bit of a, a lakeshore spin, um, just showing the difference between a natural shoreline and a disturbed shoreline or something we would typically see on more of a developed property along a lake. Um, and, you know, the, the main numbers to, to look at are the percentage of runoff that changes when you, when you change a natural shoreline to a more disturbed shoreline. Um, and the runoff increases because you can tell you're removing a lot of deep rooted uh, woody and grassy vegetation and those roots are really uh, allowing all of that infiltration to occur, um, preventing the excess runoff. And, you know, along with the increase of runoff, runoff it's increasing all of the potential, um, you know, pollutants that the runoff is picking up as it's flowing over the ground. So if it's running through your lawn and you have maybe 
put down fertilizer or some kind of pesticide chemicals on your lawn and you're right next to a water body, whether that's a river or a lake, it's going to pick up those excess chemicals and bring them right into the uh, water body, which can result in some water quality issues. Um, and Sherburne County lakes do have some excess nutrient issues and you know that's very notable in the summertime when there are a lot of algae blooms and that's usually because of excess nutrients. So um, some you know going along with the disturbed shoreline it, it can result in um, some erosion concerns um, and the common denominator in all of these photos is there is a lack of vegetation along the, the water's edge. And so, you know, and I'm not saying that a heavily um, vegetated shoreline won't experience erosion. Erosion is a natural occurrence um, and mother nature, you know, has her way and, and things can still erode even if there is vegetation. The severity of erosion, however, is definitely increased when you remove that natural vegetation um, along the water's edge. Um, and a thing to note, um, you know, Zach brought up setbacks and the, the photo on the top left is a good example of why we really wanna uh, stay true to those setback limits, not only because they're uh, regulated, but um, there could potentially be um, a structural damage because of potential erosion. Um, I'm sure many of you saw I think it was a couple of years ago on um, Mille Lacs Lake, there was some very severe ice heavings that actually impacted a lot of structures. And that is why we have setbacks uh, to prevent structures from being impacted by these potential um, erosion uh, phenomena. Uh, not every year ice heaves will occur this severely. It really has to have the perfect combination of um, wind direction and, and when the ice is coming out. But um, so, these, this is this is pretty pretty typical to see um, along shorelines that don't have a lot of vegetation um, with those root structures to really hold in that soil and and, and prevent erosion. So there are some um, restoration options, and I'm going to kind of really focus on the bioengineering aspect, and that is really just using natural materials, um, whether that's vegetation or um, different kinds of erosion control products. Um, and then I'll just quickly touch on some hard armoring options, mainly in the form of rock riprap. So when you're thinking of uh, what kind of, you know, restoration technique you want to try, um, first you want to see your shoreline and, and um, note how much erosion is occurring. Do you have a lot of erosion? Do you maybe not have that much, but you still want to um, just maybe increase habitat along your shoreline? So if you have minimal to no erosion, um, a restoration project is quite simple. Um, really just removing the existing turf grass is most likely what it'll be um, and replacing it with um, native vegetation. And there's um, a wide variety of, of plants and shrubs and trees that we have that are, are perfect for along our, our lake shores and streams. Um, and you can kind of go with a more naturalistic approach like here, it's, it's very thick and filled in, um, it looks very natural. But if you want it to look a little more formal, there's definitely ways that you can do that um, with utilizing mulch and you know, keeping it weeded in between the plants that you plant. But um, even, even with the more formal approach, it definitely is still providing um, really great uh, soil stabilization. And, you know, aside from uh, having the deep-rooted native plants help hold the, the soil here, this, this connection between water and land is a really important habitat um, to keep intact because there are a lot of, um, you know, animals like turtles and frogs and things that need both that land and water connection that have, you know, different life cycles um, in both water and land. And when we put up structures like retaining walls or, or rock walls, we're really causing a disconnect between that habitat that's really important um, for those wildlife species. And of course, the flowers are providing excellent pollinator habitat. Okay, so if you do have a little bit of erosion, but it's still not quite severe, um, there are a couple of techniques you can use. Um, the first is our, well, our bio logs. It's a manufactured product. They are made of 
compressed coconut husk fibers, um, and they're woven together with uh, a coconut fiber uh, rope. And they usually come in 10 feet sections, um, and they have different diameters. So, you know, if you have um, kind of various levels of erosion on your shoreline, you can um, piece together different size coral logs to, um, to really fit your shore. Um, and and these, these work really nicely. They're easy to install. Um, just once you get them in the water, they kind of have to stay put because they start um, taking in water and becoming pretty heavy. Um, but they, they, um, they fit along the shoreline really well and you want to make sure they're they're pushed up against the shore as tight as possible to prevent any um, erosion on the back side of the log if there's waves lapping and things like that. Um, and since they are made of natural materials, you can plant directly into the coral logs. Um, and over time with wave action and um, overland uh, runoff, sediment will collect in the um, bio logs and you know, with the plants growing their roots in them, it'll eventually kind of take over the space. And in a few years, you won't even know the coral logs were ever there. And they do degrade, but since the roots and the sediment have taken over, um, those plants are now providing that same um, stabilization that the logs um, were doing when they first were installed. If it, they are, they're temporary in a way that they, they provide that stability while plants are getting established. Uh, because it does take some time. So they're, they're still protecting that area from wave action while those plants are getting established. And then once they are established, the plants are doing the job as well. Um, so a very similar technique, just maybe a little more inexpensive, are using brush bundles. Um, uh, you, you know, it's inexpensive because you could potentially uh, source the materials on site. If you have trees, you can just um, get some downed branches and form them into any size um, of brush bundle that you need to really fit your site. Um, and uh, the one thing that, that differs them a little from the core logs, you can't plant to them because there's really no growing medium, but over time they will collect sediment um, and you know, seed from other plants around the lake will um, eventually establish in, that, um, in the, the brush bundles. Um, another thing you can do, uh, so the, the photo, Let's see. This photo right here is showing a good example of brush bundles being installed um, with uh, uh, planting on the upland side. So even if plants, you know, are planted kind of right along the crease there, the, those root structures will eventually maybe merge into where the brush bundles are to help even further hold that uh, the toe of the slope. Um, but another option, something called live fascines, and that's what this is. This photo right here is kind of hard to tell, but all of these shrubs right here, those are willow. And um, it's kind of like just taking brush bundles, but they're live cuttings. So you can you can take live cuttings of um, a lot of different kinds of shoreline shrub, like red or dogwood or um, sandbar willow. You bundle them up just like these brush bundles, but you kind of anchor them in so they're contacting the soil. And then they will reroot um, in the ground and shoot out these little um, sprouts and it'll form a really solid wall of shrubs. So this is a, um, a great option if you have, um, you know, a, a steeper slope. Um, so, you know, the shrubs aren't impacting your view. And another option that's kind of underutilized is um, encouraging or adding aquatic vegetation. Um, you know, the aquatic vegetation on lakes does a really good job of dissipating wave energy before it reaches your shore. And they're also stabilizing lake sediment. So they're, they're holding the sediment there to prevent the water from becoming murky. And for those that love fishing, you know they really provide great habitat for aquatic or organisms like fish. Um, one thing to note when you do install aquatic vegetation, you typically need to get a DNR permit. Um, so Zach mentioned, you know, the jurisdiction DNR regulates um, everything below the ordinary high water mark. And when you're, whenever you're potentially digging in the lake bed, you will need to um, get approval from the DNR. Um, and so this photo, you might be wondering what these little um, spruce boughs are doing. Um, that's providing a wave break just um, to, to protect the newly planted um, aquatic vegetation while they're getting established. That doesn't need to be there permanently. 
All right, and lastly um, is hard armoring. And this does um, you know, prevent soil loss due to wave action for sure. Um, it, is, it is preferred to be installed in conjunction with planting upland. And actually, if um, you're working with the SWCD on um, with a financial assistance project, it is a requirement. If you are doing rock, you have to have plants on the upland side to still help um, provide some, some benefits in the form of habitat for pollinators and wildlife. Um, and we will only allow rock if it's absolutely necessary. If there's no other option, if, if we don't think bioengineering uh, is going to cut it. And so this, this is usually for, for areas where, you know, there's, there's maybe limited space um, or this erosion is just so severe that um, it really needs something a little more drastic. Um, so this is a, a good example of it, of rock being done in conjunction with plants. And on this side, we had to use rock because you can see there's a, a sidewalk here. So a physical barrier where we couldn't um, create a more gentle slope um, on this uh, particular stretch of property. So, and lastly, I kind of just wanted to point out the variety of plants that we typically use um, in restoration projects, because I know a lot of people kind of have um, a skewed vision on maybe what native plants look like. They are probably thinking of road ditches where it's just some um, introduced grasses and maybe a few um, weedy flowers. Um, but Minnesota is very lucky. We have a nice wide variety of native flowers that are really aesthetically pleasing and they provide a wide variety of benefits. Um, and so I like to include both some examples for upland and shoreline, because even if you're doing you know, a shoreline specific planting, depending on how far upland you go, you might need to use more drier species as well, um, kind of have a transitionary zone. So in the upland, um, I'll just start from the top left. We have wild lupine. Um, it's a really great kind of mid spring, early summer flower. Um, and uh, it has, you know, very, very unique blooms. And then we have prairie phlox, um, this pink flower in the top middle. Um, I know a lot of people have um, garden phlox in their garden as a, a cultivated flower. They look very similar, so it's nice to add. Um, it looks um, pretty formal. A nice pop of yellow is prairie coneflower, um, and these don't get very tall. Um, and then the bottom left um, yellow flower here is, um, I believe that's stiff goldenrod, so a really great fall blooming uh, flower. And then the middle bottom here is uh, butterfly weed, uh, nice bright orange color. It's in the milkweed family, so it's really great for um, monarch butterflies. Um, it's the host plant for the caterpillar. Uh, and then the bottom right, we have uh, purple prairie clover. Uh, so a nice uh, bright purple uh, summer flower. And then for along the shoreline, um, the top left here, we have golden alexander, really interesting kind of umbrella shaped uh, yellow flower. Um, blooms kind of mid spring as well. Um, and we have top middle, this is Joe Pieweed. It gets a little tall, but um, it is a really great pollinator plant. You will see butterflies just swarming on this plant. And then over on the right top, we have um, turtle head. I know there are a lot of um, garden cultivated varieties of turtle head in different colors, but our native turtle head is this white color. Um, it's a kind of a fall blooming plant, so it's nice to have late in the season. And then the bottom, we have blue flag iris. I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, different types of iris. This does really great, um, kind of even partially in the water along your shoreline. Um, and it blooms um, a lot if it's in full sun. And in the middle, a nice, um, another pop of yellow is sneezeweed. This is a great um, fall or late summer blooming uh, flower when um, not much else is, is in bloom at the time. And then lastly, we have blue lobelia. It's a really cool, unique flower that has um, kind of a tubular shape, so it does attract um, hummingbirds. So great example of a lot of different kinds of flowers that you can have. This is, these are really short lists compared to what really is available. Um, so you can usually find something to match your taste. 
Um, and we are available for technical and financial assistance, depending on um, what your, your project may be. Um, you can feel free to uh, you know, give our office a call and we'll hopefully be able to help you out um, with, with anything that you have going on. And so I'm going to um, open the floor to some questions. Um, I have Miranda and my contact information here, but uh, like uh, um, we've all said, this is being recorded. So um, you can always look back on this if you don't have time to copy it down. Um, but we can open it up. If you uh, want to enter any of your questions in the chat, feel free to do so. Otherwise, if you um, want to unmute yourself and ask your question, you could do so as well. Brandy, this is Zach. I will ask a question. Go for it. Have, in your experience, when property owners decide to um, employ or implement native restorations and or softer, maybe softer instead of hardscaping um, mm -hmm. practices along the shoreline, such as core logs or plantings, um, does the DNR generally require a permit for that or not? They typically don't, but they do like to be informed um, just to just, you know, just like you said, um, to have that heads up just in case they get contacted by someone. Um, if it's really, if it's just a planting or a coral log that's not, um, you know, being dug in, like if there's no earth moving, uh, they typically won't require a permit. Okay. And that does bring up a good uh, something to think about or to discuss is that a lot of the projects along the shoreline are in shared jurisdictions. And I spoke on that briefly earlier, you know, for projects above the or ordinary high water level, it's within the county's jurisdiction, but if it's below the ordinary high water level, it's in the DNR's jurisdiction. But projects such as riprap or hard arming of a shoreline um, is, it, is in both jurisdictions. And something to note is that the, that the DNR will not allow riprap to be placed along a shoreline unless, unless there is active or severe erosion occurring. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess if we don't have any questions, we can, we can call this a wrap. You can feel free to um, contact us later if you are interested in a site visit or if you have any follow-up questions, but Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us this evening.